John J. Whitmire III Dean's Colloquium every year brings a distinguished graduate from Tulane's undergraduate college uh, back to campus to speak and share their story with us. This year, we are so fortunate, and I personally am utterly thrilled to have Danielle Conway join us. I'm going to read you Danielle's impressive bio. Um, Danielle graduated from Newcomb College in 2000. She's currently the deputy counsel to the president in the office of White House counsel. In that role, she advises the president, vice president, and other senior White House officials on a wide array of legal issues related to domestic policy, including voting and democracy, policing and criminal justice reform, as well as racial, gender, and LGBTQI equity issues. Danielle was previously the deputy on the Department of Justice Agency review team for the Biden-Harris transition. And prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, Danielle was a partner at Wilmer Hale, where she led the firm's anti-discrimination practice and represented companies in high stakes government and internal investigations, as well as other multifaceted legal challenges at the intersection of law, government policy, and business. Danielle also represented colleges and universities in civil rights matters and was a key member of the trial team that successfully defended Harvard University in Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard, a case challenging the university's consideration of race in its admissions process. During the Obama-Biden administration, Danielle served as Associate Deputy Attorney General at the United States Department of Justice. In that role, she provided strategic counsel to senior government officials on a wide range of litigation and policy issues and managed some of the department's most significant and high profile civil rights enforcement actions. But wait, there's more. Danielle also previously served as a fellow at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Inc. and as a law clerk for the Honorable Rosemary M. Collier on the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. She's been recognized widely for her work in the public and private sector by the National Law Journal, the Washington Business Journal, and the Diversity Journal. In 2017, Ms. Conley was recognized by Washingtonian Magazine as one of Washington, D.C.'s 40 Under 40. Danielle is, as I said, a graduate of Tulane University and the Howard University School of Law. She's originally from Texas and lives in D.C. now with her husband and two daughters. So, all that in such a short time. Can't wait to see what Danielle does with the second half of her career. <laughs> um, it's also my pleasure to introduce Bruce Carter, who, as I like to fling my papers around, um, who will be leading Danielle in a guided fireside chat for us. A lot of you probably already know Bruce. Bruce is a junior studying political science. He was born and raised here in New Orleans and is also a Posse scholar. He's a member of the Tulane Black Student Union, the Tulane Black Pre-Law Society, and vice president of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, as well as a member of the Tulane Club, ba Club basketball team. He served as a wave leader and as a host for prospective students who participated in the fly-in programs that occur once a semester. Thank you, Bruce, for facilitating this conversation. Now I'm gonna turn it over to the two of them. At the end, there will be time for some questions and answers from the audience. I would like to remind you that Ms. Conley cannot speak to details of her current work in the White House administration. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, first of all, I wanna thank you all for coming out tonight and thank you, Ms. Conley, for volunteering your time to come and be with us. Of course, but can you call me Danielle? I mean, I already yes. feel super old. Of like, course. Coming back to you, so like, <laughs> let's just. Got it. <laughs> Thanks. So to start things off, um, can you just tell us a little bit about, about your journey, your time, your time at Tulane and how it guided you to where you are now? Um, so, you know, I was, I was speaking with a group of students earlier um, and thinking about how it, I was talking about like my path and, and about how I probably need a better story because I don't like I don't have anything where it's like, oh, the minute I stepped foot on campus at Tulane, I always knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. And so I did A, B, C, and D, and that led me to the path that I'm on right now. That is, That was 100% not my story. Mm. Um, I got to Tulane and I was originally pre-med, um, which is crazy because I faint at the sight of blood. So like, I don't even know how that really happened, but I was pre-med for the first year and just trying to figure it out. Um, sort of fell into like a love of English classes and so decided I was gonna major in English. And then I was here during the years that the African Diaspora Studies program was stood up. 
and started taking many of those classes, found them really interesting and said, I'm gonna double major in English and African diaspora studies. Um, and the first semester of my senior year, and I, I loved it. I loved my classes. I, like, I loved what I was doing. Um, but first semester of my senior year, my dad says to me, so what does an English and African diaspora studies major do after college? And, um, you know, I, I was sort of like, well, maybe, you know, I'll go to grad school and become a professor or maybe I'll go to law. I was very much trying to figure it out and decided, let me take the LSAT. I've heard the saying that like, you can do anything with a law degree. Um, so let's see how this works out. And that's how I ended up in law school. I, like I would not recommend like my sort of haphazard approach, but it turned out that law school for me, like I knew from day one that I was in the right place. Like I absolutely loved it. And sort of looking back on some of the classes that I enjoyed the most at Tulane, while they weren't focused on the law per se, a lot of the classes I took, especially in the African diaspora studies major, focused on just inequities that face underserved populations. And so, and, and I mean, sort of the, the natural outgrowth of that became sort of my love of the law and particularly my, like my love of watching how the law has transformed over the span of generations, especially when it comes to protections for underserved populations, black people, people of color, the LGBTQ community. Um, and I think that's what ultimately drove me to civil rights. So a very sort of roundabout way and i cannot say it was planned at all but looking back now i will say that those studies at tulane very much prepared me for what i do today thank you so much for sharing that um well i also know that you are a member of alpha alpha kappa alpha sorority incorporated first fam um so could you tell us a little bit about um how being a part of a such such a historic organization kind of shaped um your experience at tulane as well yeah so um for me, sort of membership in a sorority was something that I knew I wanted to do because my both my mother and my grandmother were members of Alpha Kappa Alpha. And so I knew I wanted to go to, when I went to college, I knew that I wanted that to be the case. I, mm -hmm. But I couldn't have anticipated how much, you know, the sort of network of that particular organization would do for me both personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. First thing is that like the people that who are the women in my sorority so many of them are my close friends to this day i mean we go on vacation together we you know support each other's kids and like buy their girl scout cookies like we are like st still very much connected um from our time you know 20 years ago um and i think professionally like alpha cap alpha it's a large sorority the vice president is a member of that sorority which she and i have bonded over which is kind of nice um and so i think um, even professionally, just having that network that I started at Tulane has just been really wonderful. Awesome. Um, so growing up, growing up in the um, in the South, I know it's kind of a different perspective compared to um, compared to other areas of the country. So how did that? How did growing up in the South sh shape your view of um, the rest of the country, and how has that changed now that you um, work in the White House? So you know, I, I mean. I grew up right outside of Houston um, in Sugarland, Texas, which at the time that I was growing up wasn't very wasn't very diverse. Um, and, you know, I think that definitely sort of had an impact um, on me in thinking about ultimately when I chose to go to law school, I decided to go to an HBCU, historically black college, um, mainly because for most of my educational life, I had always been, you know, the only one in my class or one of a handful. Um, and it was important to me to get that experience of like not being in the minority. And um, so I, I really did appreciate my time at Howard for that reason. But I think this sort of growing up in the growing up in the South, I, you know, it's it's interesting because I, I feel like Tulane, like New Orleans is the South, but Tulane was such a transplant. At least when I was here, it was, I mean, 25% of the population was from New York. It was like, or, or Pennsylvania. And so I don't, I don't know what the numbers still are, but it, so it felt like the South in many ways, but in other ways, um, you know, it did, it, it didn't, right? And, and DC feels very much that way too. There's like a lot of transplants of people from, from everywhere. So, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I sort of think about it as more of, um, I've enjoyed the diversity 
uh, like both Tulane and like Washington and the fact that there are people from everywhere. I like being in environments where there are people from everywhere. So you touched on, uh, you touched on diversity. How did, how do you think diversity when you went to college compared is compared to like in today's, in today's time, how has it changed? Did it change for the better? Or? Well, so in talking to some students today, I've heard that the numbers are probably very similar to when, you know, I was a student 22 years ago, but um, I mean, I think, look, my, my view on sort of how universities generally are looking at diversity is that I think everyone recognizes the import of it, but it's hard to sort of put it into action. And, and to me, to me, the much more important part of diversity is actually like the inclusion aspect of things. Like you can have numbers, but if you've got a community where people don't feel included, like as a part of like, I'm a part of the Tulane community or I'm a part of the X university community, whether you're at 6% or 13%, like that doesn't really matter if like the students there aren't getting an experience of feeling like they actually are a part of a community that values them and their contributions. And so, you know, a lot of the work that I've done actually in my professional career for colleges and universities, as well as for corporations that are looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion issues has really been to focus on, you know, not just like the numerical aspects of things, which I actually think is sort of a really problematic framework, mm -hmm. and much more of a, how do we make sure that we've got a community that truly is inclusive and accepting of people and their differences? Okay, so I know you, uh, you started out say saying that you were you were pre man and then it kind of you kind of just <laughs> it kind of yeah it kind of led you to um to where you are now. So did you know what you wanted to do upon grad graduating law school, or was it or was it you had to feel your way out as well? I, well, so I um so I got to I was one of these people who got to law school and went I am in the right place. Like I love this. I was such a nerd. I loved it. Like, I, I mean, I, it was the first year was really hard. Like, I don't know if you've read the book one out, like if you hear all, all the horror stories you hear about your first year of law school, like those were true, but I still found it fascinating. And so, you know, I didn't know. And if I'm being totally honest, like if you asked me where are you going to be in five years, I would be like, I don't know. Like I have no, I have, I really have no idea. Um, and so I felt the same way in law school. Like I knew that I wanted to do interesting work, but like what exactly that looked like, like I was ready to just try a bunch of different things. And so, you know, I had internships like during the summers while I was in law school. And ultimately when I graduated, started a large law firm, went to go clerk for a federal judge. And I think it was that experience clerking for a federal judge because you see a bunch of different cases and a bunch of different lawyers come before you. And you, you know, when you're clerking for a judge and helping the judge with her opinions, you, you just get a window into all different aspects of the law. And so that helped me narrow down a little bit like, oh, I really like legal issues that involve the government. Like I found when I was clerking, the most fascinating cases were when, you know, um, it, it was the government and a private party. And like, they were in dispute. Like I found those the most interesting cases. And so after I clerked, I knew I wanted to go somewhere like to a, a law firm where you could do litigation and investigations that were government facing or involved like federal statutes or the constitution, things like that were the things that really, you know, I, I found super interesting while I was clerking. And so that's what led me to, you know, sort of where I ended up in private practice. I was at a law firm for almost 10 years before doing my first stint in government. And during that 10 years, I represented colleges and universities and tech companies and financial institutions and nonprofit organizations in like a host of disputes, often involving the government that were either the government, it, you know, it was either like, let's say a university, the government is investigating um, this university because of the way that the university is responding to sexual misconduct on campus. And the university would need lawyers to like look at their policies Right. And to, to, to help them, like, tell the government, like, OK, we're kind of doing bad here, but we promise we're going to get better. We've got these lawyers to help us get better. And like that was a part of my job was, you know, advising universities on, look, 
if you do X, Y, and Z, you're not in compliance with these federal anti-discrimination laws, but here's how you get better. And I, I mean, it was just, it was really, really great, interesting work. And then I started doing, doing the same thing for tech companies and things like that. So okay. it's great. So um, throughout your career, you fought uh, for, civil, for civil rights, of, as you've alluded to. What uh, spurred you to activism and how would you advise a student to start advocating for an issue they care about, say, on campus or after, gradu after graduation, if they want to take that path? Um, so, you know, I think a, a lot of what I've done professionally has always had some sort of civil rights bent, even when I was primarily representing, you know, um, corporations, um, because I, I just, again, did a lot of work if, a lot of work on issues if a company was being investigated because, you know, the CFO, the CFO allegedly, like, um, sexually harass someone. A lot of times the board of directors of the company would come and hire our law firm to do an investigation, find for them what happened, right? Mm -hmm. Make a recommendation about what should happen to the person if ultimately we found that there was sexual harassment and make recommendations on how to make their policies better so that they could get to a better place, right? And I think that um, doing stuff like that when I think all the way back to my time at Tulane, you know, in addition to being an AKA, the one other organization that I was in was SOAR, Students Organized Against Racism. And that was stood up during my years there. And I, I, I like, I think it was my junior year that a group of us decided that this campus needed like an organized response to some incidents that were happening on campus. Now, again, I didn't know that I wanted to go to law school while I was doing all of this, but like there is a sort of common thread, right? Um, when I sort of think back on, you know, my career and like my education here. And I, I really do think about some of the things that our group did, you know, with SOAR and some of the, some of the, the issues that I was most interested in advocating for um, were in, in that space. And so advice to students on, um, I, like, I just think, whatever you're gonna put energy into, like be passionate about it. Like it's, I think a lot of people when they're in college or in law school, just sign up for a lot of activities just because they think it's gonna look good on their resume or, you know, it's like, I have to do these things. If I wanna get into law school, then I need to do these four things. Or if I wanna do X, like I need to check all of these boxes. And at least for me personally, like it was very hard for me to get invested in things just because someone said that you're supposed to do it. Like I had to really, and I'm just like this with jobs too. I have to really personally care about the issues in order to, to grind. Like I feel like every job I've had has been, you know, sort of a stressful, high pressure job that requires a ton of work, mm -hmm. but I'm okay doing it because I care about the issues. Right. And so I feel the same way about like when you're in college and you're picking organizations to like become a part of or like issues to advocate on behalf of like, I feel like there's gotta be some passion behind it in order to really get invested. Yeah, we hear, I hear a lot about, um, especially my freshman year, I hear about not signing up for, for too many things just because it'll, it'll, burn, it'll burn you out really, really, really quickly. And I know we, uh, at the luncheon you spoke about like learning to say, learning to say no. So that kind of, that kind of speaks to um, knowing, setting your limits. Yeah, exactly. So um, could you speak about your, your current occupation and um, like your day-to-day -day, day -day duties that you, that you have? Yeah, so, um, so I'm in the office of the White House Council, which is basically like the law firm for the White House. So we're the president's lawyers. There's a White House Council, and then there's three deputy White House Councils, and I'm one of the three, and each of us has teams of lawyers who focus on different legal issues to basically lawyer the policy for the administration. So my team is, we call ourselves for short, the, the equity team. And so basically any, pol like if the administration is putting out a policy that has something to do with reproductive rights or gender equity, it's my team that are the lawyers for those policy people. So like whatever we're gonna roll out, there's a team of lawyers to make sure that like everything we're doing is legal. If we get sued, like here are the potential risks of you know our policy being enjoined by a court. So it's, it's, and then advising the president of, okay, 
we could do this, but here are the risks. And if we do this, like we think this is the right policy outcome, but it might get struck down by a court. So that's like a lot, that's a lot of what I do on uh, day to day. And it's typically related to, to issues in the space of racial justice and equity. So think policing reform, criminal justice reform, including the reform of our federal incarceration system, um, voting and democracy. We're not doing great on that front these days, but we're working on it. Um, uh, gender equity, including reproductive rights, um, Title IX issues, um, as well as LGBTQI issues with a, a real focus on what's happening um, uh, in the space of transgender um, rights and specifically, you know, state state bills that have been passed to sort of curtail the rights of transgender individuals. And so it's it, that sort of bucket of issues is really my day to day. There's some other pieces here and there um, that are just like what we'll call fires in the White House that yeah. uh, you need some lawyers to help put out. Um, and that's basically every day, but I would say you know, 75 to 80% of the work is what I describe. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so you work, uh, you work on many complex issues, I, I assume. So how, you, how do you begin to understand a tough problem that you want to solve or address that when it comes to you? Oh, um, well, I would say the first thing is like listening, right? And listening to by the time issues are up to like my level and like, here's what we need to brief, you know, the big boss or, you know, like this, here's what we need to brief people on. They're very, very, they're hard. It's not easy stuff. And, and I think listening to sort of all sides of a potential, you know, issue weighing risks and benefits. That's a lot of what we do using judgment to weigh here are the risks of this approach here are the benefits of this approach, right? Here are the potential legal risks of this approach. Here are the political risks of this approach. Um, but like that all requires like, like listening. Um, and so I would say that's the first step. And then it is really like weighing what are our goals here, right? And what, again, are our goals aligned of, aligned of like where the law is and what are the risks of like trying to achieve that potential goal? So it's not a one size fits all thing, um, but I would say it requires like a lot of listening and really like engaging to make sure you understand sort of the nuances of whatever problem is before you. So um, how do you, I know you, uh, you have, a, have a family, how do you balance your, your personal life and your work, work life? I feel like I didn't get notice of that question. Like <laughs> this is a trick question because so so I will say, and I'm gonna just be completely candid here, like there's just not much balance when you like working in the White House, but that doesn't mean that there's not overall balance, right? Mm -hmm. Like these kinds of jobs, people don't do them for very long for that reason. Like you you burn out like pretty quickly. Um and so I've sort of looked at my career as a course of like, there have been times where even when I was in private practice, like when I'm in trial, like very, very hard to sort of focus on anything else. But like, then after the trial, there's downtime and like took my kids to Disney World right after a trial, right? So there's, um, so I think for me, the way that I found the best balance was like knowing when to take breaks, right? And knowing that like, to me, this whole idea of work-life balance, you can't have that every day, but you can have it over the, like maybe over the course of time, like, you know, high periods, downtime, and then really taking advantage of the downtime. So that's, I don't, I don't know if that's a good answer. That's the best. Oh, I mean, that is like, that, like, that's just honest. Thank you. Um, so what would you say are some of your, uh, some of your accomplishments, accomplishments that you're most proud of over your, over your professional career? So I will say the thing, I think the thing that I'm most proud of actually just happened, um, which is it was um, our team in the council's office that drove and led the confirmation of Judge Jackson to the Supreme Court. And I think for me as a black woman and as a black woman lawyer, getting to be a part of the team that ultimately helps put the first black justice on the Supreme Court, like for me, it doesn't get any more like meaningful and impactful than that. Um, uh, I also think just that whole process of, um, you know, the president sort of making a commitment early on that this was important to him and then like finding truly the best nominee 
right, and getting to sort of usher her through this process, prepare her for the, the hearings, um, uh, and ultimately, you know, getting the getting the votes, getting a, 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 we only got three Republicans, but it was still three Republicans, so it's bipartisan, 53-47, like that is, you know, it, that was a, a really wonderful day. It was just last week, it feels like eight years ago, but I, I, I would say one of the like best professional moments I've had was last week, sitting on Capitol Hill, like in that gallery, watching the vice president, first black woman vice president preside over the confirmation vote of the first African-American woman Supreme Court justice. That's so amazing. anyway, that was just last week, but like <laughs> it, it- That's amazing. <laughs> So um, is, was there ever a time where you feel like, oh, I could have, I could have done more, or you just feel so or over overwhelmed with every with everything going on? And how do you get through those? How do you get through those tough times? How would you advise a student or somebody else who's going through a tough time like that? Yeah, I mean, there, are, I feel like that a lot, hmm. um, because I think, you know, especially when you really love what you do and like care about it, like you know, you become a perfectionist. You want, you want to get it right. So I always feel like we could have done that a little bit better or, you know, I could have given a little bit more. Um, uh, and I've had to like step back a little bit and like learn to like have a little bit of grace for myself, you know? Cause like, right. I, you know, I, I do think sometimes you can be your own toughest critic um, and just having some perspective of like when you get in those moments going but wait wait but here are all of the things I did right like right. here are all of the things that I did well like here are all of the ways in which I added value to this space it's like a good way to sort of counteract the the like internal negativity of like I could have done this better but I have felt that almost anytime I've tried a case anytime I've had a trial that, like that's what to me that's when the feeling is most acute because you put a witness on the stand or whatever it is and you sit down and you're like, I didn't get this thing. I could have done that better. I could have done that better. Um, and I felt that way throughout the, the Harvard trial. So we, um, when I was in private practice, we represented Harvard in the case challenging their, their use of race and admission. And every day, like it was, I mean, it was, it was such a hard trial. It was a really, really, really tough trial. And every day I sort of felt like, God, like, I could have done that. We could have done that a little better. We should like I should have I should have asked this question. Right. You beat yourself up, you know, but we won. <laughs> I mean, we'll see what happens at the Supreme Court, but you know, we won at the district court level. And so again, like giving yourself a little bit of grace and, and focusing on, you know, what you did right in those moments, I think is a good way to push through. Thank you. So we have uh, one final question. Uh, what advice would you have for students, especially young women who wish to enter into a public sector? sector your legal career? Um, you know, I think my number one piece of advice would be don't feel like you have to have it all figured out. Like, you know, if you want to go into the public sector sort of in, in the legal field, there's so many different things you could do. You could be a federal public defender or a, you know, state public defender or, you know, go to the ACLU or NAACP Legal Defense Fund or, um, you know, work for a non -profit. There's just so many things that you can do. And so, trying different things like using spaces for internships while you're in law school to like just try different things and talking to people about their careers I think is a really good way to like you know explore a bit but also not feeling like if you make a decision you go somewhere and you're like oh I hate this that's okay like leave there are plenty of other jobs so like not feeling like you have to stay somewhere that you I, like whenever I talk to people who are like, I'm in this job that I hate and I've been here for 13 years, what are you doing? Like you, like you are like, go do, go do something. Life is too short for that. And so I am, I am very quick to say, like, if you are not enjoying what you're doing, like life is too short. The law is too hard, right? Like these jobs are way too hard to stay um, in a place where you're miserable. Like it really, it is not worth it. That was, I don't know, that was, I don't even know if that was an answer to your question, but that's my advice. <laughs> all right, well, um, that's all the questions that I have. So thank, I just want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and just thank you for being here, Daniel. Thank you.
We do have time for questions from the audience after that wonderful display. Um, I love the combination of um, the, the grace that we see Daniel affording both herself and, and to us too, in kind of giving us permission to not know everything right away um, and not have to feel like we have it right, right from the beginning. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to repeat the question to the mic just so I, so the question is um, uh, from a paralegal in the audience. Thank you for coming. Um, if Danielle and her team have paralegals as well. Yeah. So in the council's office, there are, there's a, a smaller team of, it's a combination of like paralegal, other sorts of like assistance type jobs. Um, not, not the same sort of grind as like a paralegal in a law firm, because it, it, it's a different sort of job, but it's still very much like helping the attorneys on the team like synthesize information put together you know briefing books and documents in a way to get us ready to like run into meetings yes y you all are desperately needed <laughs> yeah, go ahead Yeah. So the, the um, question is how Danielle made the jump from the private sector to the public sector from a student who's thinking about doing this herself potentially. So when I when I went to a law firm like after my federal clerkship, I knew that at some point I wanted to go into government. I mean, it's why I was in DC. I liked the idea. I had sort of talked to people who had gone in and out of like government and the private sector. Um, but I didn't know what that job, like I had no idea like what that job could look like or like what I wanted it to be. I just knew that at some point I wanted to do something interesting in government, which is like not at all specific because the government is actually quite large, right? So, like, so, but, but I mean, really that's, that was my, I was, I knew I wanted to do something interesting in government. And if it had like a civil rights or criminal justice bent, even better, but I wasn't even like, like pigeonholing myself to that. It was more of a, let me see if a good opportunity comes along. And so I ended up being in the private sector for nine and a half years before the right thing came along at the right time. And I'll tell you, I mean, the first job in the government that came my way came at a time when I was five months pregnant. And I was like, I can't leave the private sector to go to the government that has no maternity, like at the time, no maternity leave, like no, like, I mean, it was just, I, like looking at it, I was like, this makes no sense. This is, I can't start a new job, have a baby, leave. like it just, it did not, it did not work. And you couldn't have told me at that point that I didn't like miss my shot to go into the government forever. I was so depressed. I was like, oh my God, like, I can't believe this came along at this time. And it just turned out that like a couple years later when I was not with child, I got an offer to go to the Justice Department to be um, Sally Yates's deputy. I don't know, Sally Yates was the deputy attorney general um, under A.G. Lynch in the Obama administration, but to be her deputy on basically all things civil rights and criminal justice reform. And so I jumped and like went immediately. But that came about through like basically me doing a, um, a bunch of different pro bono work on like voting rights issues, like while I was in the private sector, I always had my foot in doing pro bono work in on issues that I cared about. And I got the attention of folks like of folks in her office. And that's how I got called into that job. But like now looking back on it, had I not been pregnant when the first opportunity came about, like my life would have been totally different because that job was not civil rights related at all. It would have been interesting, but it was like, like actually like not like the thing that really brings me the most joy. So, I mean, it took nine years, but then I got there. And then after that one job, it's been sort of easy to go in and out. Um, like that world is sort of a small place that like, once you've had certain government jobs, people think about you for other things, um, so. Voting 
So Dakota is asking, so I'm repeating for the benefit of everybody watching on Zoom. Um, Dakota is asking how Danielle um, takes care of herself as a black woman who's fighting these fights um, at, in Dakota's words, very tumultuous time for voting rights, civil rights, um, LGBTQIA rights. No, it's a great question. And I will say like, one of the great things for me about work is that when you really care about the issues, work doesn't feel, I mean, it still feels like work, but like I enjoy doing it so much because I care so much that even most stressful times, I still feel like insanely lucky to get to do this, right? But the emotional toll sometimes of like, you know, when we didn't pass the, the voting rights legislation, like that was a huge blow for our team, like on a very like personal level, right? Like, you know, I mean, I'm thinking about like my family members who marched, right? For us to be able to have this right and how important that legislation my view is to sort of the continuation of like our democracy right and so like that, i mean that's heavy stuff to take home right and and i feel the same way when i think about sort of reproductive rights and what's happening on that front um lgbtq like the list goes on and on and on so to your question the first thing is is that as much as i try to compart compartmentalize it and say all right like sometimes you just need to leave work at work that's kind of hard when it's like, but like, these are people who look like me who are being impacted by these kinds of things that I'm working on. So I can't even say I'm good about, like I would lie. I'd be lying if I said I compartmentalized and didn't bring work home. I bring work home all the time. I'm thinking about it all the time, but I do love my Peloton. And so I, <laughs> so I wake up really early and I run or I ride. And like, I like, that is like time to like clear my head and like, try and like get rid of, rid of as much stress as possible. And that's like the best, I, that's all I got. <laughs> I think that's pretty good actually. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. Corinne. Danielle, I love what you said about talking to people who have more experience than you to help you make informed decisions about how you might learn their experience. So in the theme of like what you've learned now, what did college age Danielle need to know? Oh, oh. great question from Corinne who says, Basically, what would current da present Danielle tell college age Danielle? If you knew then what you know now. I mean, I think the first thing I would tell her is that it will be fine. <laughs> like, you are kind of a mess, but this is going to work out, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I really, I really do, because I did not. I really did not know what I wanted to do. Like, I, I'm like, I'm not joking at all that I sort of really did go to law school. Like it was first semester of my senior year. And I was like, what am I going to do with these degrees? This seems interesting. Like it was not, I didn't talk to career. I'm sure there were career counselors here. I, I did not talk to them. I don't know why I didn't talk. I, I talked to no one. Like it was, you know, I had my circle of friends and we were all like, what are we going to do? It, it was not the most informed path, like at, at that age. But, but I would tell that, so, like I was very anxious about it by the time senior year came, but like, it was okay. Like it was okay. And I, I also think, um, you know, to the extent that I have any regrets, actually, it is not using the resources at the school more because I didn't like, I, I really, Carolyn, I, I, I mean, I, you were the only like non-professor I think I ever spoke to. Like, I, I, I'm not kidding. Like, I didn't use any of the research. Like, I didn't use, I'm sure there were people who could have helped me think through this and helped me think through, like, what would be a good fit? What are some other options? And I didn't, I didn't utilize those resources. Um, and so I would tell myself, like, maybe talk to a few people um, just to get some ideas. And mainly because I think it would have made me less anxious about the uncertainty that, you know, sort of lied ahead. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, what's the most challenging thing about being a woman in government? So I will say, at least like where I am now in, in, in the Biden administration and the, the folks who are like our team in the White House Counsel's Office, we're 65% women. Like if you look at the senior advisors to the president and vice president, it's over 50% women. 
Um, this, one thing I will say about, I could say many wonderful things about our president, but one thing I will say about this president is that his commitment to gender equity and racial and ethnic diversity and diversity of all kinds for his senior team and the, the, the people around him, it's real. And so um, I think that being a woman lawyer, being a woman in government for me is probably a lot easier, a lot easier than it was for women 20 years ago, right? Or even, you know, maybe even a shorter time than that. Um, but I'll say that like, at the end of the day, it's still not like a utopia, right? There are still these moments where, you know, maybe I'll call somebody at another agency who doesn't exactly know who I am or whatever it is who like, they'll make certain assumptions just based on seeing you or based on hearing your voice or whatever, where, where you know, like, oh, that was actually super gendered. You would not have said that if I was a dude, right? Like, so that's still 100% happens. But I will say that like in my immediate circle in my day to day and the work that I do, I mean, the vice president is a woman, right? Like the, in the work that I do, um, like having a bunch of like very high powered women around you is like a nice place to be. Yes. That's a great question. How do you handle all these challenges at this time when we see so many of our rights under attack? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I, to be totally honest with you, I, you know, I think, I mean, sometimes I definitely get down about it, but I also feel like, okay, well, I'm in a place where I can help. Um, and a part of the reason that it was so easy for me to like, leave private practice yet again um, uh, after President Biden won the election um, when I was asked to, to come in and do this job, you know, one of the main reasons that I said yes was for that reason. You know, it's a, uh, well, if I can, if I can play like even a small part in helping to like preserve some of the things that are most fundamental to me um, and to my community, then I want to be able to do that. Um, and so, you know, look, I, I, I'd like to, I mean, maybe I'm a glass half full person. I'd like to think that they're like fundamentally people are good. And like, sometimes we have to go through like bad spots, but people fight and we get better. And I'd like to think that's the way that I think about our democracy is like, sort of look back at like periods of time and like start to gain rights. And then there's like, people go crazy, right? And then there's like this significant retrenchment, right? And then you got to fight all over again, but then you get a little bit better. And then there's so, so I'm thinking that we're in that period of, you know, we saw the first black president, right? And then we got President Trump and then, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to get too political, but like we did see, you know, an erosion of some of our rights there. And I think it just, it, it's got to encourage people to like, to fight for what's important to them and to like really use their voices to like, you know, advocate for what matters. Um, and I just, I, I try and do that with my work. Yeah. Thank you. 
Oh, I know. I wish this is, we could have, we could be here all night. I mean, this, yeah. So no, I mean, one thing I'll say is I really am serious that like this should not, this is so much more than a numbers game. And I think whether you're talking about a university or a company, you have to be thinking more broadly than just like, what are our numbers? One, like that's problematic under the law. But like two, I actually think it does not work. It does not work if you don't facilitate a culture of like making sure the people that like you're so you're recruiting, right? To like help with your diversity. If you're not building a culture to which those people want to be a part of and feel a part of, then you're not going to keep them. It's going to like, it's just going to be a continual churn. Um, so, you know, I, I would say, I, I, more and more companies are hiring, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility experts to come in and do reviews and like help companies like think through these issues. I think number one is like, if you're a company and you're gonna hire someone like that, like make sure that person actually does that. Like a lot of people, like I've seen it way too much where companies, universities, whatever, they'll just like pluck a person of color and say, oh, because you're black, you must be able to do diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's not true. Like there's like, there's like, this is, I mean, these, this is, this is complicated stuff. It takes experts to like really figure out the culture of an organization or a culture, you know, of a business um, and figure out like where the, where the need is, how to make that culture more inclusive. Not anybody can do that just because you're a person of color. So I want companies to stop doing that. Like stop just like pulling like, oh, there's a black woman in banking. Let's make her the head of DEIA that like, that never, ever, ever works. Um, so, I, you know, that's like one piece of it to be totally honest with you. Like, I think folks are like very much still trying to figure out like what strategies work the best, but like based on what I've seen, based on my, my, my practice in the private sector, I really think that the companies that do it best are the ones that it is like important from the top down. It is the CEO of the company saying, this is important to me. Like, I'm going to hire a chief diversity officer who is an expert in these issues, who's going to report directly to me, and I'm going to make sure my entire leadership team is focused on this. And it's focused on this when we're talking about hiring and promotions and retention, right? Like, it is a top-down thing. Like, in the same way that, like, CEOs decide, like, I want the culture of my organization to be welcoming to, like, young people, so I'm going to, like, let them bring their dogs and, like, wear jeans to work. It's similar in that way, like you've got to figure out like, well, what works for these particular communities? How do I make it so that they want to stay? Um, and I think until like all organizations have that kind of mindset, this little experiment isn't going to work. That's a great question. I don't know that I've ever thought about it in a, so when I was a, when I was a relatively young lawyer um, and first starting out in private practice, um, th there were a few like pretty significant, um, for me at least, pretty significant times where it was like, this is like, I was clearly not given this opportunity um, or someone assumed that I couldn't do this. And, and like, I can't prove that it's because of my race or gender or the combination thereof, but like, this is nuts, right? And that happened like, you know, a few times. And there were, there were other times where I remember when I went to go actually um, defend my first deposition, I think I was a fourth or fifth year associate at a law firm. Um, and my client hadn't gotten there yet. And I walked into the room where the deposition would be an opposing counsel was there with their client and it was three three men three white men um and as soon as i walked in one of the the lead counsel on the other side looks at me and says oh great you're here you can go set up your stuff right over there and i said set up my stuff your, your stuff to take the court reporter and i was like mm, except for that i'm gonna sit right here because i'm the lawyer who's like and, and so but like there were moments like that you know that wouldn't have happened if I did not look 
the way that I look. And it was, you know, super rattling. It was like, I was about to defend this deposition in this like very big lawsuit. And like, now my mind, like now I'm completely distracted that this man has assumed that I was the court reporter. But like, I've learned, now that's happened now more times than I can count, like, but I learned in that moment, like, I just got to do this job. I can worry about this and like bitch about this later. But like right now, I've got to defend this deposition and do the very best I can. I cannot let this get in my head. Um, that's hard. And so I would say to the extent that there have been roadblocks, it's been getting over something like that happens. And it's like getting over that hurdle, right? Um, even when I was, this was relatively recent when I was trying the Harvard case. I mean, I remember going into the courtroom in Boston with my legal team and I was the only black lawyer and like there's a special line for lawyers where you can show your bar card and you don't have to like take off your electron like you can just sort of walk through security and I get in the line and the security guard looks at me and says your line is over there right and I was like no my line is right here because I'm a lawyer on this case right and he was like oh I'm sorry I, but it's things like that and, but again this was about to you know I'm going in about to try an extremely significant case that gets in your head it gets in your head and so to the extent i can think of any roadblocks it's like trying to like push that back and do my job um and that's tough that's a toll that like you know not everybody has to experience as they go through their career um yeah okay thank you laura for helping me keep track of time well, one more question. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Kay. You answered a lot of questions. I really enjoyed it. You're going to make people feel good. What advice would you give to the students? You know, I think oh, I'm going to give a couple. Number one is, you know, utilize these networks and the people around you, right? Because you're gonna look up 10, 15 years from now and like run into folks from Tulane, like in whatever career you're in and like you're gonna have that connection, right? So I think like just making sure to like build connections with your classmates um, and trying to keep some of those connections will be super useful. Um, and I did that through my sorority and it has paid itself like in dividends with like both friendships but also professional opportunities. Number two, I would say this is not like, this is, this is the beginning. Right. And like you literally do not have to have it figured out to like have a great career. And you're going to have friends who knew from like day one that they wanted to be an electrical engineer and then they go and they do exactly that. And like that, that's fine if that's not you, you know, and I like I think that made me very angsty in college, like not knowing like what I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. It still makes me angsty now. Like if somebody was like, hey, 10 years from now, like, where are you gonna be? I don't know. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing after this job. So like, so, I, but, 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 it, but I've learned now that it will be fine. Like if you put in the work, you will have opportunities and it will be fine. And so I guess that, that would be the advice that I give. That's a wonderful note to go out on. Thanks to all of you for your wonderful questions. Thank you, Bruce, for your expert moderation and facilitation. Thank you, Danielle, for coming Thank and sharing you. your story and insights with us.